Education, data, equity. Reluctant project manager. Gamer, nurse, developer. Job interview today. Hi, I am Sarah Karp, and the, the reason why I said I was nervous is because I definitely think that probably any one of you guys could run data circles around me. Um, I do do a lot of work using uh, data. Um, you know, there's actually about a month ago, our work decided that they were no longer going to give us access to Excel, and I had about a heart attack, and you know. Um, went to my boss and complained, and they're letting me keep it because I, I use Excel like all the time. And um, I'm always looking at things like, you know, different demographic data, different budget data. Um, and, you know, one, one thing that my, one of my f friends who you, who you probably know, Matt Kiefer, he's a data person at um, BZ. And he's just like, Sarah does next level Excel stuff. So that's mainly where I work. But, um, but you know, I, I've done stuff in R and a couple of those other things. But I'm, I'm pretty um, matter of fact. Like, I, I don't, I'm not too intricate. My codes aren't very intricate or anything. But um, this project, the school closing project, did use a lot of different types of of data and a lot of different ways of collecting data. So I, I do think it's interesting because, you know, part of the, the, the reason why I think that it turned out well was because two things. One, three of the, like, five or six people who worked on the project were people that had been in Chicago covering school closings in 2013. So we had a lot of knowledge of, like, what people said, of sources, of data sources, and then we also, um, so that was one really important thing. And the, other, and the other thing is that we we knew like what was out there in terms of data, like what we could get, and I think that that really helped because, you know, a lot of times um, when you're starting a big project, you have these like grandiose ideas about what you can get, but then as you you know, go along, you sort of realize, oh, I can't get this stuff, and so how am I going to um, do what I want to do? So this was a, it's a, it was a project. It was about the 2013 school closings, and if you guys don't know, at that time, um, then Mayor Rahm Emanuel closed 50 schools, and um, there was 50 school closed. Over 13,000 kids were in those element. They were all elementary schools at the time, um, and that over 13,000 students were in those elementary schools and would be displaced as of the closings. And that also, Chicago Public Schools, they invested $155 million in what they called the welcoming schools. These were schools that were in relative proximity to the schools that were being closed and that um, were supposed to take in the kids that were, were from the closed schools. And so the big questions that we set when we sat down and said, what do we want to do here is we wanted to sort of look at the promises made by um, then Mayor Rahm Emanuel and by CPS officials to see, you know, did they come true? Was, was this... Um, successful? Did it do what they said it was going to do? Because it certainly did disrupt a lot of people's lives. And so there were three things that we kind of honed in on. Number one was that the buildings would be quickly redeveloped as community assets. So at the time, what they did was they formed these committees that were supposed to be um, run by the aldermen around each building. And they were supposed to come up with plans, and then they were supposed to figure out how to get people involved with the plans. So that was one thing. The second thing was that students would escape poor performing schools and receive a better education. So the criteria for why these schools were closed were, were there were many layers to it, but the two main things was one, that they were under-enrolled and um, underutilized, but the other thing is that they were poor performing. So a lot of times what you would hear from 
Mayor Emanuel and from CPS officials was we are doing something good because we are getting these kids who are in poor performing schools out of these poor performing schools and getting them into better schools and therefore the trajectory of their education should totally change and you know this is something that that we should be applauded for because we're we're doing something positive for them. Um, now, whether that, that was the real reason why these schools were closed was, you know, as many people questioned that, but that's at least publicly what they said. And to that end, as I was saying before, they invested a whole lot of money in what they called welcoming schools. And, you know, th that was twofold. One, they said that when you, when we would invest in these welcoming schools, basically we were taking you're, we're taking the money out of these poor performing, underutilized schools, so we have extra money and we can shift them to the welcoming schools and they'll be better off. Um, and, and then also that these, these neighborhoods, a lot of them had a lot of very low performing schools, and so this, the neighborhood would be left with this reinvigorated, wonderful welcoming school that had all their resources. You know, they said, well, we're gonna put libraries, we're going to put, every kid's going to get an iPad, um, you know, we're going to put science labs, so there are all these bells and whistles that these schools are going to get, and the idea is that these would be better schools. Um, so I'm going to start with sort of each, pro I'm going to take you through each promise and how we kind of figured out how we were going to answer the question of did, you know, did these promises come true? Um, for the one that was, you know, were buildings quickly redeveloped as community assets? So one thing that we decided to do, and this was me and I had two colleagues from the Sun-Times, Lauren Fitzpatrick and Nader Issa, we said we need to visit every single solitary building. And why did we do that? We could, you know, part of us was like, well, we could look at all the records and see, but, you know, just because a building was sold didn't mean necessarily that it was being utilized, right? People buy buildings for all sorts of reasons. Also, you know, we wanted just to see what the condition was of the buildings that were still in Chicago Public Schools, you know, um, inventory. So we went out to each school. We took pictures of a lot of the schools. We talked to residents around the schools, which, you know, just sort of hear what they thought you know, what's been happening with the building? What has it been like since the school closed? Where do your kids go to school now? So we had, you know, we, we talked to a lot of people. I mean, I had hours and hours of tape and we really met some wonderful people um, out, out when we were just going from building to building. The, there's one couple that um, really stands out and they're featured in one of the pieces where the man's family had lived in this house. This was a house in um, West Englewood, across from a closed school, since like the 1800s. That's a long time, right? And yeah, and so he, I mean, obviously he wasn't from the, he was 94 years old, but you know, so he was like born in the house, his fa raised there, he, he moved away, and then he came back with, when he had a family, and then his son had um, bought a house just about three or four houses down. And so they had a lot to say about the buildings, about the building that was vacated. And then we also, we, we got every real estate record um, and appraisal that we could through Chicago Public Schools, but also through the Cook County Recorder of Deeds, through, you know, tax sales. So we, we, you know, we really sort of looked underneath to see who actually owned these buildings. And we wound up creating our own database, which you can kind of see here, but, you know, it had a lot of different fields to it, um, notes and, you know, who visited what building, what we found, what we found for sales transfers. So, we made this, this big database, and then when we were done, we were like, okay, what does this tell us? Um, and what we found was of the 46 schools, so the reason why it's 46 and not 50 is because some of the schools housed two, two schools, so when they were closed, it only resulted in like one building being closed, but there are two schools. Um, there's also a lot of like weird things that happened. Um, with these school closings, weird weird things that they that they did to sort of justify certain schools clo closings, including like there are a bunch of schools where they closed a school 
but not a building. And then the school that closed moved into, it's like they, they didn't want, so there was a school that was lower performing, so they closed that lower performing school, but they wanted that building because that building maybe was in better shape than the building, than the welcoming school building. So it's like the welcoming school kids moved into the building of the school that closed. So it's just sort of crazy, right? So you, you might sometimes see a school in, in Chicago where the outside sign says it's um, this school, and then etched into the wall, it says it's a whole different school. And so sometimes that's because of these weird school closings. Anyways, so of the 46 buildings that were shuttered, um, 20 are back in use. So, so much for um, quickly redeveloping uh, the property. Um, so only 20 are back in use. And one thing that was really interesting about that, a lot of these 20 are just coming back to use like in the last year or two. So, um, you know, so even those weren't really quickly utilized. Um, there's, there's one building, um, on the west side in Austin that it's literally right now, it's being changed into this beautiful job training center um, and a lot of public money is going into it, but it's just happening now. So it's not a quick redevelopment. Um, you know, one of the other things that we, we found is that for the ones that were redeveloped, a lot of public money went into redeveloping. So even though, you know, Chicago Public Schools will say maybe we saved money by um, closing these schools, in a larger sense, taxpayers might not have saved as much money because taxpayers paid, for example, there's a, a school in Pullman that was changed into senior housing. And the amount of... Um, housing preservation t vouchers that went into that is very steep. So we're talking millions and millions of dollars. So, you know, it's a good use of it. It's great to see, you know, it's, it's a cute building where uh, they still have chalkboards from the old school and these old ladies were like, I write my, my um, psalm for the day on these chalkboards, it was great. But still, it wasn't, this wasn't cheap, you know, it's not, it's not a cheap thing. Of the 26 that are still dormant, 16 are still publicly owned, most of them by Chicago Public Schools, a few of them, um, at least one of them by the Chicago Park District, so, you know, it's, it's, um, it's publicly owned, but, and then um, the other 10 that have been sold, uh, of the ones that have been sold, um, 10 are still vacant. So these are buildings that were sold to sometimes developers. There's one developer, for example, that bought two buildings, one in, um, in Pullman and, or Roseland and then one in Englewood, and the buildings are just sitting vacant. So we found that out too, that just because it's sold doesn't mean that it's in use. And in fact, one of the interesting things that we found is that when the building is still cared for, by Chicago Public Schools, they send people out to mow the lawn, to shovel the sidewalk. If the buildings get broken into, which they frequently do, they'll send somebody out to reboard up the windows. But these, when these are owned by private developers, then if they're not using it, these are the buildings where you drive by and the weeds are this high and the windows are torn off and nobody's coming by there, there and they're getting tickets for not keeping up the buildings. So in a way, being sold is not a great thing for the neighborhood because now this neighborhood has nobody really to call. You can't call the Chicago Public Schools and say, come and you know, mow the lawn because it's owned by some private developer. So that's, that was one of the things that we learned by going out and then asking questions. And the other thing that, this is something that we weren't able to get real information about, but we, we wanted to know how much the school district has paid keeping up vacant buildings. How much does it cost to you know, shovel the sidewalk, to mow the lawn, to come board up buildings? Um, they couldn't tell us. They, <laughs> um, what they said is that you know, they, they don't delineate it, so they have a crew 
of people who go out and mow lawns for all schools. And you know, this school would be part of their lineup, but they couldn't really delineate, okay, this is how much we're paying for this school to get its lawn mowed. So we weren't able to get that. We, we tried, but um, they said they didn't have it. So, so that was the question, the promise. Were the buildings quickly redeveloped? And um, I think that that was a resounding no. And I think that that's not, no surprise to people who live in Chicago, especially where most of the buildings are, which is the south and west side of the city, because you can ride around the south and west side of the building and you see a hell of a lot of vacant schools just sitting there. Um, and a lot of those were from 2013. And a lot of those were from pre-2013 because there were, you know, Chicago Public Schools had closed about you know, five or six buildings a year for about a decade before the... Um, the big school closings, at, at which point there was a moratorium on school closings, so they kind of stopped after that. Um, the, ne the next promise, students would escape poor performing schools and receive a better education. So this was the thing that everybody wanted to know. What happened to the students, right? And how could we figure this out? So one thing that had happened is the Consortium on Chicago School Research um, out of the University of Chicago, had done a report five years out saying, what they said is that right after the school closings, the test scores of the kids dropped, but that they seemed to rebound as the years went on. However, in a way, I kind of thought that wasn't exactly the right question because they weren't promising we won't hurt you. They were promising we're going to help you by closing your school. And they were telling the parents. In fact, they were sort of painting the parents as, look at these crazy parents who want their kids in this poor performing school. So the, at that point, the question is, did you help the kids? Did, did these kids have better, better um, trajectories? Um, one re thing that was um, kind of lucky about, about this is that soon after the school closings, um, I, I was trying to do a story about, um, at, at the time the CEO was Barbara Bird Bennett, and she had said that only seven kids from the closed schools, we don't know where they are the next fall. So I was like, yeah, I, I'm not so sure I believe you. So I had gone to the... Um, that, and then there was somebody from the Illinois State Board of Education who actually told me, like kind of offline, that CPS had sent them a list of all the IDs of all the kids that from the closed schools and asked them, where are they? <laughs> so it was like, if you know where all but seven are, why are you asking the state board if they have any idea where these people, kids are? <laughs> so, um, so I had this list um, from back then of the IDs of all the kids from the closed schools. Um, you know, technically, a lot of times, ISBE doesn't want to give you, like, the actual IDs of kids. However, um, in this case, they did. But what it allowed me to do, it allowed me to know that I could ask ISBE again, what happened to these kids in the years post, um, you know, post the school closings? And, we wound up having to do a data sharing agree agreement, um, which is very different than a Freedom of Information Act, because it's basically like a research thing. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever done something like this. Yes, yeah, so, so it involves lawyers and it involves all these other people and making a whole lot of promises about not um, not disclosing, uh, you know, like you. It was a private database and all, you know, all this stuff. But, that's, but that was fine because I, I was not trying to reveal individual kids' information. I just wanted to know where did they go to school post the school closings? What were their test scores? What were their absenteeism rates? You know, all these other questions. Um, the other thing was how can we say that they did better? Like what, what is the comparison? You know, you don't know how they would have done had their school not closed, right? So how can you say what they're gonna do better? And what we decided to do was, um, we decided to compare them to similarly situated schools. And 
We came up with a list of 50 sim similar schools by um, looking at when they originally announced the school closings, they originally announced 129 schools that were on the list. So we, we knew those 129 schools were similar in some respects because they were underutilized and underenrolled. That's how you kind of made that list. And so then we, we looked at other things like demographics. Um, the kids in the closed schools were overwhelmingly black kids. 86% were black kids in a school district with only 41% black kids. So we looked for, for similar schools. Um, and then also the ones that had similar test scores so that we could kind of compare, okay, these were kids that were of the same academic level. Um, I have to say, it was a little, not queasy, but I, 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 I hate the idea, like, we're comparing you to similarly kids that were poor performing, and then we're going to say, did you do better? It's like, it's such, it's such a deficit mindset, right? But... At the same time, you know, it at least could give us an idea, like, did they graduate more? Did they, did they attend schools more? And um, after a lot of back and forth with ISBE and lawyers, we finally got the information. Um, we got it about mid-April, and the story was to come out in mid-May. So, and we got, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of records because what they gave us was... Um, they gave us an ID, and then a school where they were enrolled, and then like if they exited the school, and then like information about them. So it was like, and so it was each school that each kid was enrolled in until they they left the state of Illinois until they graduated or otherwise left. So it was like one kid, and many of these kids had lots and lots of roles, had like, you know, could have like up, upwards of, you know, 15 rows just for that one kid. So every time he or she changed school, so especially like if you were in kindergarten, you know, you, you might have a, a lot of, a lot of rows. And so it was, it was a big, it was a bit, big undertaking to figure out, okay, now what are we going to do with all this data that we got here? Um, how are we going to look at it? And, um, you know, one thing is that pretty easily we could look at like the, the kids that took the ACT or the SAT, what was their, what did they score compared to the comparison group of schools? And um, it was really no better. And it was way worse than most kids in the school district. It was um, under 800 points. I think it was like seven, I don't know, 81. That's combined, not for each subject. And anybody who's taken the SAT will know that that's pretty, um, pretty not so great, you know? Um, so on that question, for the kids that did take the SAT, they, they did not do that much better. Of the kids who could have graduated, and so we sort of looked at like if you were in between third and you know twelfth grade in 2013, but nobody was really in twelfth grade because these were all elementary schools. But like third through eighth grade, did you graduate? You know, you you could have graduated by, or you should have graduated by, you know, the end of um, last, you know, the school year before 20, 2021. And the answer to that question is about 62% graduated, and not just from CPS, but from a Chicago public school. Um, and that was really no better than the kids from the comparison school, about exactly the same. And that's way worse than CPS in general, way worse than national averages. Um, and so that was also, you know, pretty, pretty stark. So like, going to this better school did not translate into you graduating. Um, two other data points, which I don't really think you can see here, are about transferring. So one thing that I was really interested, because a lot of people said this, is like, we're just going to leave. We're just going to, you know, this school is what tied us to the community. This is the school that we felt safe with. This is a school that you know, my grandma went to, my mother went to, my uncle went to, and now that that school's gone, you know, we'll, we'll move out of Chicago. And um, we did see a lot of evidence that 
that the kids that went to schools that were closed transferred more often to other schools than, than other kids. Um, and that, I can't exactly remember the figure, but I have it here. It's like half of them left Chicago public schools within some time. Now, some people came back. Some of those kids, like, they, they left and then they came back. You know, maybe their family moved and then moved back. But still, a lot of kids did not wind up staying in Chicago public schools. And, you know, one reason why this is a really important finding is because, you know, a lot of what you hear from people is like, oh, there's been this exodus of families, especially out of the south and west side. And, you know, it's kind of beyond people's, con you know, a lot of lawmakers make it seem like it's beyond their control. Well, there are some things that tied people to communities that once you took those things away, then, you know, people did leave. And, and there's a lot of factors in people leaving. And there's a lot of factors in people staying. People don't always stay because of the schools. Sometimes they stay because they don't have, you know, their jobs are around or they don't have a, another place to move to. But, you know, th there is some evidence that, that, you know, once the school was gone, people moved. I, I actually want to tell you about one other finding that wasn't my finding, but um, I don't know if you, I think Alden Lawry's probably been here. Has he ever done a hack night? Alden Lawry? Oh, no, I don't think he has. He, he's a data editor at, at WBC and he's a whiz. Um, and he is very, 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 very good at census stuff. Um, and he was able to find, and I think this was one of the most stunning findings of the entire series, that the neighborhoods right around the schools that closed. So like the census, I think he did like a, um, like a half mile around the school that closed. Saw greater population drops than neighborhoods where schools didn't close even in communities where there was a high exodus in general. So even in, you know, you, you take like a neighbor, like Inglewood, which has lost a lot of population, or Woodlawn, which has lost a lot of population, but you just narrow into the places where schools close, those small geographic areas lost more population than other geographic areas in those same communities. So I thought that was pretty stunning because you know, it's, it, it kind of says, you know, maybe why did people move out of those communities? And maybe some of it was like, you know, an empty old building that's about a block long might not be attracting the best crowds all the time, <laughs> might not be the place that you want to live. You're taking this place, this school that was teeming with children, teeming with, you know, opportunity and hope and activity, and then you're changing it into just a completely desolate area, you know, that, that can't be good for the community. And, and it showed that people did leave those specific areas. Which I was, I was kind of surprised, though not surprised. So I thought that was a very, a very important finding. Um, the final thing that we looked at was um, this idea of the welcoming schools would be better off. You know, these schools had big investments. As I said, it was like iPads and, you know, uh, all these bells and whistles. They got specialty programs, fine arts programs, science, STEM programs, you know, and um, they also got new paint jobs. They got air conditioning. They got new windows if they needed them, you know, new boilers. They were set up for success. And I mean, the idea was the schools will be better for the kids that are here, but maybe also you put this big investment could this keep people from, from leaving? Could it, keep, could it, you know, these schools become draws? Um, and we looked at a couple of different things. We looked at um, the current enrollment and utilization of the welcoming schools. We looked at the budgets um, over time of the welcoming schools. And then we also look at te looked at test scores and programs um, at the welcoming schools. You know, one thing that kind of stood out to me is that um, nine schools got libraries as part, welcoming schools at libraries as part of, you know, when the schools closed, which not all Chicago public schools have libraries, but of those nine, right now, only four still have any staff member running the library. So five of those libraries that were, got this big investment 10 years ago are just sitting, you know, with books collecting dust because they're not being used. Um, so I think that that's sort of telling, you know. This sort of shows that, that there was, you know, th 
one of the things about what we found was that the school officials, that while they put this big investment at one time, um, they failed to protect these resources over time. Um, and one thing I, I, I want to note, because I think it's pretty important, is that this money, this investment, was bonds. So this is money that, you know, you, a lot of times you'll hear people talk about Chicago Public Schools and, oh, we're getting so much money per child. And, I mean, Paul Vallis was saying this a lot during the campaign. Why don't we have better outcomes? And um, one thing is that we have a lot of debt in Chicago Public Schools because we take out a lot of, we've, over time, we've taken out bonds for a lot of capital repair bonds, but a lot of bonds for other things. And in this case, you know, we're still paying on that $155 million. And so the question is like, were those schools you know, better off? And um, one thing that we can say is that the welcoming schools wound up losing more students than, um, than Chicago Public Schools in general. And Chicago Public Schools has lost 20% of its student enrollment over the last 10 years. Welcoming schools have lost 38%. Um, and there's variety, so it's not all the schools. And actually, one of the cool graphics, I, I don't have it here, but one of the cool graphics is we have like little graphics for each of the schools that shows like their enrollment declines. Um, but one, one thing about it, when I talk about officials didn't choose to affect, um, to keep up the resources is that the year after the schools closed, the year after the welcoming schools got this big one-time infusion of money, Chicago Public Schools changed to a system that very closely tied funding to enrollment. So it, it w went to this sort of market-driven approach where basically like the kid carries the money on, on his or her shoulder and goes to the school and the school gets, um, gets a, a bit, most of the money that they get was per child, per student enrolled. So as these schools lost enrollment, they lost money. And so all these initial investments get sort of drained away over time. And actually right now, I mean, one thing that, that's happened is that people have realized that this way of funding schools kind of creates this self-fulfilling prophecy where like you lose enrollment, so you lose programs, so you lose enrollment, so you lose programs, and so it's like this, you know, it, it just like this downward slide that, that schools can't, you know, can't help um, and can't like get out of. Um, so, yeah, so a lot of these schools lost a lot of money over time because they lost a lot of enrollment, and so a lot of these things did not hold up, and um, they, be, they just became victims of this like same sort of trajectory, um, even though they were welcoming schools. Um, and the utilization is these, almost all of these buildings are underutilized. I mean, some are way, 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 way underutilized. Um, you know, this is a lot, like 30% utilized. And I will say something, utilization is a kind of weird thing because they're like utilized by CPS standard, but a lot of times the school is using the space it's just that the way CPS sees it, they don't need the space, you know? So I, a lot of people push back against utilization and using utilization as, as, any, as anything. But I think the point that, you know, Rahm Emanuel was making 10 years ago and that people still make is, you know, you're heating, you're cooling, you're, you, you have this whole building that could fit a thousand kids, but is really fitting 200 kids, and is that a good use of resources? So that's sort of like the, the calculation that, that um, the mayor was making. And um, I don't think I have another slide, but what I was gonna you know, just end by talking about is like, what does this mean today? And why is a project like this, you know, why did we think it was important? And I, I think to note that 10 years later, We've lost more enrollment in the last 10 years than we did in the previous 10 years. So we still have a, uh, an issue with under enrollment. We still have an issue with under utilization. And we have some schools that are very much like in, in pretty precarious positions. We have some high schools with like 40 kids, you know, very, very low enrollments. And the question is, 
you know, do we repeat what we've done in the past or do we try something else and what else can we try? And I think that that's um, something that lawmakers, that um, Mayor Johnson, that other people are trying to grapple with because, um, yeah, we also only have a limited amount of money. And um, Pedro Martinez, the new CEO of CPS, you know, he talks about like if we want modern schools, if we want green schools, it could cost upward of $10 billion. And, and we have a lot of just critical needs that schools have not been taken care of. I mean, you know, the last couple of weeks with the heat issue, I, the heat outside, that the schools weren't cool inside, you know, that sort of brought to light that there's a lot of critical needs in these schools. And so, you know, do you spend money on a building that doesn't have that many kids? What's the alternative? And, um, you know, I think that keeping in mind some lessons from the past, um, you know, probably would be a good thing. So I think that's, that's partly why we wanted to do this. Um, this and yeah, so that's what we did. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm happy to take questions, <laughs> so. Um, thanks for this reporting. Um, I know there are limitations on um, who and how you can speak to folks around this issue, but I'm curious, those most affected in communities, um, students and their parents, what um, from the qualitative side of things stood out as far as what folks were sharing about their experience through this journey? Yeah, you know, it, it's sort of interesting because I, on one hand, you know, this happened and people were very much affected, but then people went on to live their lives. And especially if you're like a fourth grader, you know, it, sometimes we'd ask a, a, a young person whose mother said, that, yeah, this, you know, my, my child had to change schools. And the young person was like, well, I don't really remember that much about it because, you know, they were a little kid. And, you know, what they remember, one young woman told me, I just remember I had to wear a different color uniform. So, um, you know, the, so I think the kids had different experiences. Um, a, a lot of the parents um, said that the schools that the kids went to were chaotic. And one, one, one thing, too, is that um, only about a third of the kids actually went to the welcoming schools. So um, at the time, a lot of parents were saying, you want us to go to this welcoming school, this other school. That's not the right school to send our kids to. You might say it's going to be better, but you know what? They got to cross Ogden, a busy street. My child is not crossing Ogden. I don't care what you say. So they went to a different school who didn't get the investment. And so there was a lot of chaos like that, where like people, where like a school that had no way or no extra resources suddenly had 50 new kids that they had to figure out how to incorporate without any extra resources. And um, you know, I talked to this one kid, and I think I have his picture. This is Archie Hayes. Um, and he, he's kind of interesting because he's also like, according to my 18-year-old um, son, he's actually a pretty like famous rapper. But I didn't know that, so I just called his, I just called his mom and was like, oh, you know, what's going on? And she's like, and she actually said, um, so she, she, I got her name because um, either I or one of my colleagues interviewed her 10 years ago and happened to have her name in a notebook. So I called her, and she was like, oh, you know who you should talk to? You should talk to my son, Archie. And um, I did, and... You know, he, so what happened to him and his brother, he has a brother that's about one year younger than him, is right afterwards, they went, they went to the welcoming school. It was chaotic. There was a lot of fights there. They didn't like it. Their mom moved them to another school um, about a year later. They stayed in that school for about a year. Um, she said it was chaotic. They didn't like it. Then she, I don't know exactly how this happened, but she figured out how to get them enrolled in, um, a suburban elementary, in an elementary school in Berwyn. Um, and they went there, and they actually said that was a great, they, they liked it a lot, it had a lot of resources, um, even though Berwyn schools, you know, are not probably the most resources, but the, compared to what they saw in Chicago, they were like, this was a very, you know, we went on field trips, we did this and that. So they were pretty happy there. But then for high school, they wound up going to, um, 
uh, two separate charter schools, one charter school, then he said, well, I got into a lot of fights, so I wound up going to another charter school, and then he wound up going to an alternative school, and, um, and then his record hit it big, and he never quite graduated, <laughs> and so he's... He's, and so, okay, on one hand, you know, he doesn't see his school, his school trajectory as like that bad. But he went to six schools post the school closing, and the school that closed was a school that his whole family had went to for generations. So, you know, would things be different for him had he been able to stay in that one school? I don't know. You know, I don't, but, but certainly, like, you know, he did go to two schools that he said were pretty chaotic, and there were fights every day, and he got in some of those fights, and, you know, so, and he wound up, you know, f going from place to place, and his mother's always searching for a place where um, she felt, where she felt connected to the community. And, you know, a lot of times, it's the parents who want to feel connected to the community you know, the kids, they don't, you know, they're a little more um, able to adjust. But, but the parents, you know, a lot of parents told me, like, this was such a traumatic thing. Um, you know, these were their friends. This was their people, you know. And then it was just gone one day, and they had to navigate a whole new, new environment. So thank Hi. you so much for um, your presentation this evening. Um, my question is, what do the... The real estate developers, are they just, is it just a waiting game? Are they waiting for the property values to get, what do they get? I mean, how are they making money off of this deal? And who made money off of this deal, really? Well, there's a question that, uh, you know. Think, um, yeah, that's where the incentive is. It's always, I think, like, wh whoever's making the most money is the one that probably is pushing their agenda a little bit more. Right. And, you know, some of these, you know, you, you do sort of wonder, you know, who, the city has not done much of anything to get some of these buildings off of their off of their plate. And does the city think that eventually they might have some use for this or be able to sell it to somebody at more cost, you know, once, you know, once this, the neighborhood changes, right? Um, but w one thing that's interesting is I talked to a guy who owns one building and tried to, tried to buy a different another one. And he is an, uh, an SRO developer. And basically, he, and he's for-profit SRO developer, but he was thinking that there would be money there to develop this. He wanted affordable housing, you know, stuff. But it is, and this is something, because I don't cover housing, that I didn't know how hard it was to get money to develop affordable housing. And I guess it's really, really, really hard. Like, there's um, 150 applications for affordable housing vouchers, and they give seven every year th through the state. So there's not a lot of money. And renovating these buildings costs a lot of money. You know, it's, these are schools. They don't have a shower in every room. They don't have, you know, they don't have a bathroom. They don't have kitchens. They don't have, and, and you know, these, not only were they old and falling apart buildings 10 years ago, a lot of them, they went in and, you know, people came in and stripped anything valuable out of the building. So they're really like just shells of themselves. And, you know, because the school district hasn't done much to, for them, a lot of that happened, and now they're just, you know, they're just really hard to develop. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I, I, think, I think there's some of that. I think there's some of that, and I think there's some people who are sitting on it. I mean, that one guy that has a place in Roseland and has this place in, in Inglewood, I mean, we couldn't really figure out what his deal was, but we know he bought these properties. It really, I mean, they, they're selling this entire block long of a city for like twenty-five, fifty thousand dollars. I mean, that's like nothing, right? So, I mean, it's like it's nothing. So, holding on to that, I'm sure, doesn't hurt anybody. Yeah. So, I, I mean, that's the thing. So, people have some of these properties for a long time. Oh yeah. I mean, the guy, that, that guy who owns these two buildings, I mean, we tried to get a hold of him multiple times, and he was just like, eh, 
you know, had no, no interest in speaking to us. So, I mean, the dream was, or the idea was that these properties were going to be turned into community assets. So they could be community centers. They could be, they could be affordable housing. They could be, you know, something, job training programs, but it's just very few. I think only five are really now like a real community asset. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know what they should, I mean, to me, and I talk to a lot of experts, like, how can you redevelop these buildings? One of the things is that there, it's, there should be public money behind projects like, you know, like, um, if you want to create a community organization. So Chicago Youth Center um, has a beautiful new center in southeast Chicago. It's like a daycare and after school, just beautiful. And they got five million from the state to do it. Um, but not not everyone's going to get that. So, yeah. Have you seen any examples of other cities trying something similar and either succeeding or failing in the same way? Or have you heard of other? Like, is there any precedent for even trying to do this, or is it just a horrible idea? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I do think that you know, e even in Chicago, when it was not that many at a time, it seemed a little more manageable. Not to say that the kids did better or that the buildings were redeveloped quicker. But, you know, you do five buildings, you could take some time. Um, in D.C., they're doing a lot. Of, they put a lot of money towards reusing the buildings that they've closed, and they've actually, like, you know, have a lot more examples of, of good reuse because they put money and they, have a pl they had a planning process. It took many years for them to put that in place, but, um, but they, they've been able to do, so to do some things. So um, that's one example. But... The truth is in that urban, you know, in cities across the United States, there are empty school buildings sitting there and decaying and, you know, for a myriad of reasons. Um, and and I, I, I don't think that we've had a good, a good idea of what to do when a school loses a lot of enrollment. I, I will say that there's a state law now that requires that if Chicago public schools ever wants to close a building, a building again, they have to have a reuse plan. Um, and in um, 20, the last time schools closed, there was a consolidation in Inglewood, um, when Inglewood STEM opened, it's a new high school, but they consolidated four schools, and they actually do, like Harper High School, which was one of the schools that closed, is housing community um, organizations now. And that was very intentional by the community organizations in the area. But, yeah, so I think that it has been learned that we shouldn't just close buildings and be like, and then we'll figure out what we're going to do with them, so. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for the presentation. Um, this had a question about, like, the, for the control group that you used. Did you also look at, I guess, the test scores of those schools prior to 2013, back when they were still open? And I guess, would that have changed um, the results at all? Well, that's what we did. We took like the 2011 test scores of the schools that closed, and we tried to find find similar schools. So out of that, like, out of the 70 schools that were on the list, so they had low enrollment, low utilization. So th then we looked at like racial makeup and test scores, and um, CPS has had this like a rating system. So we tried to find schools that were similarly w rated. And we went back and forth on this list trying to figure out the right control group. So, you know, the point is though, they didn't close. So they might have had some other positive things going for them that these closed schools didn't have. But th some things that are maybe untangible. Because, you know, what you see on paper in a school is not you know, the essence of a school, you know? So it's hard to, it's hard to um, find those, those things. But we tried, to, we tried to get a pretty good control group, so, you know. Awesome, I think we will call it there. Everyone, please give a big round of applause for Sarah.